Sorry. <laughs> uh, we have a monthly e newsletter. And if you would like to stay connected to us throughout the year, it has information on our research, sustainability efforts, um, upcoming events. So we'll just pass it around during the talk and feel free to sign up. Okay, thanks. Great. Good morning, everybody. Um, as uh, Katie mentioned, my name is Emily. I'm a PhD student at UCLA. And I wanted to thank you first off for coming and taking time out of your morning to um, today, I will be talking a little bit about my research, which seeks to assess mechanisms facilitating the success of the invasive alga Sargassum and Horner Eye on Catalina, um, otherwise known as when algae attacks. Um, but before I get into the gruesome details, um, I want to talk a little bit about how I got to where I am now and also how I got interested in what I'm studying now. So I grew up in Michigan, um, the Ann Arbor area, if anybody is familiar, and I was lucky enough to spend the majority of my childhood outside, um, particularly in and around the Great Lakes region, as well as um, vacationing to the coast of North Carolina and Florida. So I really became exposed to both freshwater and marine environments growing up and really started to develop a love um, for these environments. And some of my favorite activities were uh, boogie boarding. I eventually learned how to do it the right way. Um, surfing, believe it or not, there's places you can surf in Michigan. Um, playing on the beach, another unfortunate hobby of mine is eating sand, but I also grew out of that. Um, but then as I grew older, I also developed an awareness for changes that were occurring to these environments that I, started, that I had loved so much. Um, the first of these was the invasion of zebra mussels. Um, so zebra mussels are a type of freshwater um, shellfish that are native to the, uh, Ukraine and Russia and um, invaded the Great Lakes region around the um, 1980s, but really started to proliferate um, during my childhood. And changes I began to notice were um, once sandy bottoms becoming like, blanketed with these mussels, and then boat hulls and intake pipes kind of being followed with these. Um, so this was one change I noticed, and another change was the invasion of Eurasian milfoil. Um, so Eurasian milfoil is native to Asia, Europe, and North Africa, um, but started to proliferate in the Great Lakes region around the 2000s. So um, a change I noticed associated with this was like um, these large dense mats being um, formed by this alga and kind of um, really impacting the ecosystems that invade, invaded. So these were really big problems in the Great Lakes region um, during my childhood and currently still are. So um, I became really concerned with um, why these changes were happening um, to these ecosystems I love so much, but also um, how they could be fixed. So this was kind of my first step towards uh, conservation and conservation of these aquatic communities that I love so much. So this led me to a particularly transformative experience with this program called Odyssey Expeditions, which um, basically leads high school and middle um, school age students on sailing trips throughout the Caribbean um, and teaches them about the ocean environment, but also um, conservation issues associated with the ocean. Um, so during my time with Odyssey, I learned how to sail, I got scuba certified, I got my open water and advanced certifications, and then I also um, got my first taste of underwater science. So um, I learned how um, researchers rehabilitate sick or um, injured sea turtles and kind of um, to eventually be able to reintroduce them into the wild. And then I also learned, or I participated in my first underwater survey. So I actually um, got to ID and count reef fish that were included in that year's population census. Um, so after participating with Odyssey, I was pretty convinced that marine ecology and marine conservation was something that I wanted to pursue on a future career. So then I uh, started to pursue a degree in marine biology from UC Santa Cruz, and I um, got my scientific diving certification through UC Santa Cruz, um, which basically allowed me to conduct underwater research on my own, and then also expand my knowledge base of the ocean with classes like um, marine conservation, kelp forest ecology, and marine botany. And in addition to these classes I was taking, I was also lucky enough to participate in several research projects. Um, the most notable of these um, was dealing with abalone conservation. Um, so abalone is a type of marine mollusk, and um, along the west coast there are actually several species, many of which are unfortunately um, threatened due to overfishing and disease. So the project I was associated with was looking at methods that would try and um, try and restore these populations back to their natural levels. Um, so abalone is pretty cool because it has 
a larval stage that um, basically floats around in the water column and requires this pink, paint-like looking algae called Crestos crone algae to um, initiate its settlement from the water column onto this alga. Um, and then from there, it um, initiates the transformation into the adult stage. So this algae plays a really important role in its like this uh, enabling life history, but little is really known about um, why are the ecology of this algae. So my role was to look at many, many cobbles with this algae growing on it and try and tease apart morphological groupings of this algae because it's really hard to distinguish um, this algae to the species level and see whether there are more or less abalone larvae um, settled on these different groupings um, to see if there's some type of preference associated with um, this algae. So following undergrad, I continued on working with this um, abalone project. Mm -hmm. And so I went up to the University of Washington with some um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, looking specifically at how this algae influenced um, populations of pinto abalone in the San Juan Islands. Um, and then I uh, started working down at a research station in Chile and Patagonia for a couple of months. And then I got a job with the Department of Fish and Wildlife with the ground fish ecosystem. Um, basically, um, my main role with these guys was uh, helping with their outreach um, and talking to fishermen and making sure they understand um, for the ground fish fishery. Um, so this was about a year postgraduate, um, and I was testing the waters in a variety of different ways. And, um, I figured that I wanted to continue my education um, at, with a graduate degree. So I started a PhD at UCLA and was pretty set on continuing my work with this crustal coral and algae and abalone. Um, but as I started to delve a little bit deeper into it, I realized that a lot of the work I would be probably doing for my dissertation would be baseline descriptions of the ecology of this algae, which is important, but didn't really have the applied conservation aspect that I really wanted. Um, so, kind of trying to figure out what I want to do next, I came out to Catalina Island as a teaching assistant for a field quarter and started to learn about the Sargasso Corner Eye Invasion and how it was potentially um, impacting the ecosystem, but also how little was still known about um, how, uh, what it was doing out here and also why it was so successful. So, I made the transition from one charismatic macro algae to the next, and I started studying Sargasso Corner Eye, which is where I am now. So before I get into um, the details of my research, I wanted to give a little bit of a background that kind of informs um, what I'm doing now. So what are invasive species? Um, while many species may travel from their native location to a non-native range through a variety of vectors, species that have really no discernible impact on the environments they invade are considered to be introduced species. On the other hand, species that have a negative impact on the environment they invade are considered to be invasive. So species invasions can lead to a variety of negative impacts, including loss of ecosystem services, or basically the services the ecosystem provides to humans, such as uh, food, uh, recreation, such as boating, fishing, etc. And because of the loss of these ecosystem services, um, invasive species can also lead to economic loss because these ecosystem services often generate some type of revenue. Additionally, species invasions can lead to reduced ecosystem complexity, habitat loss, and because of these issues, they can also lead to severe declines in biodiversity. So a little bit um, transitioning to my study species, Sargassum corneri. Um, it's a brown alga in the class Theophyceae. It exhibits a rapid growth rate and a high fecundity, so it's able to produce many baby sargassum pretty quickly. Um, it's, it can grow up to three meters in length, so it's capable of forming these dense canopies that out, um, kind of uh, create a really shaded environment in the understory. It possesses air bladders that buoy the individual up towards the light, and also when it becomes attached, it's able to kind of float long distances that facilitate long distance dispersal. It has a high temperature tolerance, in an annual life history, so it completes its entire life cycle within one year. So Sargassum corneri is native to Korea and Japan, and it arrived in Long Beach Harbor in 2003. Since its arrival, it has spread throughout Southern California, um, so throughout the Channel Islands, and then north towards Point Conception, these little dots represent Sargassum corneri invasions, uh, invaded sites. And then also, it spread south into Baja, California. 
So um, despite its rapid proliferation and widespread range, um, little is known really about why Sargassum cornerii is so su successful versus other um, introduced species and whether certain communities are more susceptible than others. Um, so where Sargassum cornerii is able to establish, it's capable of forming these dense monocultures that um, are hypothesized to be outcompeting native algae for space and light, which can have potentially severe impacts on the ecosystem and base. Um, so this kind of leads me to my research question, which is um, what mechanisms facilitate um, community susceptibility or resistance to invasion, and then also um, facilitate the success of Sargassum cornerii. So a little bit of background behind this question. Recent research actually found that um, from long, studying long-term data, that there are communities that are more or less susceptible to invasion. Um, so these, yeah, as I mentioned, are conclusions from long-term data from the Northern Channel Islands, Channel Islands, which is basically um, kind of uh, community ecology data. And um, what they found were was that resistant communities were those that um, had been protected from fishing for a long time, so older marine protected areas or MPAs. Um, so in these sites, um, there was um, a high abundance of these top predators, uh, California sheephead pictured here and then California spiny lobster um, because they weren't being overfished um, because they were protected. Um, and these predators are um, really like to eat sea urchins, which in turn are voracious herbivores of algae. So in these sites that were protected, these um, abundant predators were able to keep sea urchins under control. And in turn, there was um, a diverse algal community in these sites. So where, um, so when Sargassum cornerii, when they predicted where Sargassum cornerii was trying to invade, um, this diverse owl community was out competing Sargassum cornerii, and Sargassum cornerii was not able to. On the other hand, these researchers also found that sites that were unprotected from fishing were also resistant to invasion. So in these sites, um, sheephead and lobster were overfished, and because of that, urchin populations were overly abundant. And because of these overly abundant urchin populations, the algal community was decimated, um, including Sargassum cornerii, which is um, based on these predictions. Um, so these were also resistant to invasion, not because of a diverse algal community, but because of um, intense herbivory pressure. So herbivory was the mechanism controlling Sargassum cornerii there. Um, and then the researchers found or predicted that the most vulnerable communities were communities that had recently been protected from fishing. Um, but didn't really have a chance to kind of develop an um, abundant predator population or had varying urchin levels. So neither um, competition or herbivory um, were strong enough to control Sargassum cornerii there. So this research, um, as I mentioned, was all derived from long-term data and there weren't any empirical tests of these conclusions. Um, also, this was only um, concluded for the Northern Channel Islands and specifically Anacapa Island only. Um, so my research specifically seeks to address whether competition in herbivory, so competition via algal diversity <coughs> and urchin herbivory determine community vulnerability and resistance to invasion in, um, on Catalina Island specifically, but um, the, the Southern Channel Islands in general because the Southern Channel Islands are quite different than the Northern Channel Islands and there may be different dynamics at play. Um, and then another one of my questions is, uh, do the conclusions of this previous research um, uphold when exper uh, experimentally tested? So do the conclusions from the long-term data actually match what is happening in the field? So um, to test these questions, I first chose four field sites. Um, the, first, let's see, the first one is Isthmus Reef, um, then West Two Harbors Campground, which is by the Two Harbors Campground, and then Chalk Cliffs, which is just outside the Blue Cavern MPA. And then this red star represents where we are now at Ridley Institute. Um, so my excellent dive team and I, Lauren, um, we first conducted a bunch of quadrat surveys where we looked at algal diversity, um, invertebrate, um, different invertebrate abundances, and then um, also took abiotic measurements of substrate and relief types in these communities. Additionally, we also um, counted and ID'd the number of urchins in these sites, basically along a transect, and we also measured um, the test size of these urchins to get kind of a holistic representation of what was going on in these communities based on the predictions by this previous research. And what we found was that there were significantly more urchins 
at Isthmus Reef and Western Harbors in the other two sites, which was perfect to test the um, hypothesis of herbivory as a mechanism controlling sargassum populations. And then for um, algal diversity um, to measure competition, we found that there was kind of a gradient um, of these sites. So Isthmus Reef had the highest diversity and also the highest, one of the highest urchin densities there. Um, so I predicted that this site would be most resistant to invasion because both competition via algal diversity and herbivory would be strong enough, maybe strong to control sargassum horn right there. And then um, campground also had a high diversity but low urchin abundances. So um, potentially competition could control sargassum horn and herbivory. West two harbors, on the other hand, had high urchin densities but low diversity. So Again, herbivory would control sargassum hornet there potentially, but not competition. And then finally, chalk cliffs um, had both low urchin densities and also low diversity. So I predicted this site to be most vulnerable to invasion because neither competition nor herbivory would be able to control it there. So then um, to test these um, hypotheses um, that I had, I deployed some growth experiments, which basically consisted of me um, collecting a bunch of um, little baby sargassum, or um, right now most of it's in the recruit stage, so less than five centimeters in height, and then um, spinning all of the algae in a state-of-the-art device, um, a low-velocity centrifuge, otherwise known as your household salad spinner. Um, <laughs> so this basically standardizes the amount of water that's on um, the algae and allows us to get an equal representation of how much each um, alga weighs. Um, so we would weigh the algae after we spun it down um, and also take maximum um, diameter and height measurements. And then um, we attached all of them to rope and we caged half of them, or so half of the replicas per site. Um, so these cages are completely closed on the bottom and the sides, but open at the top. And so they have these lips at the tops that basically are specially designed to prevent urchin herbivory specifically but allow other types of herbivory to occur. So as the urchins climb up the sides and reach the lifts, they can't hold on anymore and they fall down. So it specifically seek, um, seeks to address the pressure of urchin herbivory, which was what was predicted um, to be controlling sargassum um, from the previous research. So then um, we deployed these experiments at each site. And then to make sure the environmental conditions were similar between sites, um, I also deployed temperature and light loggers. Um, so after two weeks, we collected everything again and reweighed everything and um, measured the diameter and height again to see how much each, um, how much the algae grew in each of these sites. And so these are just um, some pictures of my experimental units. On the right are my uncaged algae. And then on the left, you can see these cages with the lips and are like open at the top, and then also um, an excellent photobomb by a <laughs> So what I found was that herbivory and competition can control sargassum hornari, but it's complicated. So I'd like to start off first with um, Isthmus Reef, which I predicted to be most resistant to invasion. Um, and you can see that it appears that that's the case. Um, so, uh, Sargassum horn rye grew the um, least at this site, but because there's such a discrepancy between um, the uncaged um, algae and the caged control, I concluded that it was probably um, herbivory that was controlling it the most here because um, the caged controls grew so much more than the uncaged one. Um, and then West Two Harbors is interesting, um, and I've been trying to figure out how to interpret this, and this is my best interpretation. Um, so even though um, there were a lot of urchins at this site, this site also had the greatest amount of open space than any other site. So there's a lot of bare rock there. Um, urchins are known to really only graze within a certain radius of their home crevice. So um, I figured that potentially where we laid down the experiments were outside of the grazing radius of um, these urchins. And um, because there wasn't a lot of other algae to compete with sargassum horn right there, it was actually able to escape both herbivory and, and grew the most. Um, campground didn't really change that much, but chalk cliffs is another interesting one because I predicted that this site would be most vulnerable to invasion. So it would, um, sargassum horn would grow the most here because neither competition or herbivory were really strong there. Um, 
But what I found was that um, I was using algal diversity as a proxy for competition, which um, I now realize may not be the most um, reasonable way of looking at um, competition. So Chalk Cliffs actually has a very high percent cover of this order of algae called Dictyotales. Um, and so Dictyotales forms these the, like this dense um, like kind of mat underwater. And I figured that um, because Sargassum Horneri decreased in growth so much that it was actually competing with um, this dense algal cover. So there's almost no open rock here at all. Um, so it was still maybe competition that was inhibiting Sargassum Horn right here, that, but not so much um, as a function of algal diversity, but mostly just the total algal percent cover at this time. But then I figured that if this was the case, then the caged and the uncaged control should show a similar pat growth pattern because it wasn't really herbivory that was controlling here, but competition. And this led me to realize that there was probably a flaw in my experiment design. Um, so right now, my cages are completely closed on the bottom. Um, and when we would put them out on the algal beds, it kind of smushed all the algae underneath it and allowed Sargassum horneri in the cage to get a competitive advantage over the algae underneath it. So it had readily, readily access to light and space that it didn't really, um, that it wouldn't really have otherwise. So um, this led me to modify my cage design to be completely open on both sides of the bottom, save for a small strip of cage that we would attach, um, we attach Sargassum Horneri to. So this allowed um, algae that was growing on the bottom to interact with Sargassum Horneri still, but to have the cages still exclude urchin or vibrity. So we have, I actually have an experiment out in the water right now, and um, we'll see how, um, what the results look like, because this will allow me to um, kind of get a better representation of how competition and herbivory are, may impact Sargassum Horneri um, at a more accurate and final resolution. So implications for this research, um, it's apparent from the results of my experiment, also previous research, that certain communities are more or less resistant to invasion um, by Sargassum Horneri. Um, recent um, attempts at uh, removals of Sargassum Horneri have actually found that um, in the removal plots, Sargassum horneri was 80, 80, um, more dense than prior to removal. So um, it was concluded that widespread eradication of Sargassum horneri is likely not feasible, but um, recently invaded sites before Sargassum horneri is able to establish should be targets for um, control and uh, removals because they haven't really um, had a chance to establish a strong population. Um, so um, my research seeks to find these vulnerable communities and then also use them as targets for um, rapid monitoring and rapid control um, for the spread of Sargassum horneri. So we may not be able to fully eradicate it now, but we can control the spread. And then also further understandings of these invasion mechanisms, such as competition or bivory, will enhance the predictability of the invasion. So where Sargassum horneri may be moving. Um, so I'd like to thank a couple people for um, helping out with this research. Uh, my PhD committee, um, particularly my advisor Penny Fong, um, my excellent dive support, uh, Lauren Smith, who's in the crowd here, and then also a variety of funding sources, um, specifically the Wrigley Institute for giving me the amazing opportunity for letting me come out here and do my research and also um, incorporating, me, incorporating me into this wonderful panel. So any questions? Yeah. First of all, that's a great talk. Um, secondly, uh, if you grew up in Michigan, then you know the story of the alewife and the coho salmon? I think so. I in other know. words, the alewife was brought in by shipping and had no natural enemies, so it overtook Lake Michigan. And when they would have a die off, tons and tons of dead fish would build up on the beaches. Yeah. And they solved the problem by introducing coho salmon into I know Lake Michigan, because that's where we live on Lake Michigan. And I just wondered if there's a possible analogy here. Is there something from Korea that we would rather have in this water than to have, that loves to eat this stuff? So that's, it's an interesting question. Um, I think there, there are success stories with introducing um, species from the native range to control the invasive and the invaded range. But a lot of times it basically causes another introduction of an invasive species. So like um, 
let's say if we brought like urchins from Korea to Catalina Island to control sargassum corneri, they may control sargassum corneri, but they may also eat a bunch of all like a bunch of other algae here too. So they may be um, become another problem. So um, that's an experiment, isn't it? It, it is, it is, if, if it's able to be, like, if we can control... It looks like there were some inland lakes that had this problem, right? Inland lakes, Sargassum? Yeah, when you showed the map, it, maybe I got it wrong, but it looked like there were some black dots of so, infection inland, not just in the ocean. So it is, it's a marine algae, so it, I, it shouldn't be able to um, go inland, but let's see... You need salt water. Right. Yeah, so this is... The white ocean. Yeah. yeah, okay, you're right. Yeah. I, I misread that. Mm -hmm. So so you'd have to take one isolated area and run an experiment. Yeah, I think it would have to be very carefully monitored and maybe like on a small scale first. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, like that's an example of a success story. But a lot of the times it just, it does end up introducing like another invasive species. It causes like two problems rather than one. But we love the salmon. What? We love yeah. the salmon, boy. <laughs> I got a yeah. question. And you might have already covered this. I'm probably going to butcher the question. But you mentioned most susceptible areas are newly protected regions. So, like, if you have any kind of natural disaster, you have, like, primary, secondary succession. Like, is there evidence to show that after time, of being protected, that the ecosystems will kind of balance themselves out, native species will move back in and kind of correct itself? As far as the invaded areas? Yeah. So I think um, it's hard to say. It could be that um, maybe as water is cool, so it's hypothesized that Sargassum did, um, did so well because of the El Nino on the warm water. So like potentially, um, best case scenario, as water is cool, Sargassum Corneri doesn't do as well. And the native community kind of bounces back and restores itself to its natural state. Um, another hypothesis is that this, these sargassum horror invaded areas are unfortunately basically an alternative stable state. So they are there to stay, and that's what the community is going to look like for. Um, um, so I'm, I don't know, I can't really say. I hope that the community will bounce back um, when protection kind of. Um, is established and is able to, I guess, kind of create a diverse community more, um, but it's hard to say. Yeah. Is this, are you tying this to your research on the abalone? Um, so, kind of, well, not really. I think, like, they all have an underlying conservation theme to it, but um, I kind of stepped away from the abalone. Um, potentially, um, it would be interesting to look at maybe how sargassum corner is impacting the abalone populations on Catalina. Um, but I, yeah, I haven't really sought that path yet. Um, have you researched on the water temperatures as to what what's the lowest that uh, they could, could survive at? So there has been some research um, in the lab. Um, I think it's um, some research from San Diego State have been looking at the temperature tolerances of sargassum corner eye. Um, and then um, my lab mate Lauren is actually looking at how competitive interactions between sargassum corneri and native algae um, change with different temperatures. So, um, yeah, yeah. You know, because right now we're going through a heat wave for the last 10 years or so that uh, if we reverse and go to cold water, it would solve the problem. Yeah, so there, there's also some insight that you can take from, um, so this algae in its native range is actually um, heavily cultivated for agriculture. <laughs> Um, and so there's a lot of kind of physiology um, data out there for this algae as, opposed, as far as like temperature tolerances. But um, I, I would assume that it kind of matches what's happening here, but um, it, could be, it could be different. So, yeah. What were some of the thoughts on how it found its way over here? Has it been like cut, like ties and currents, or is it like zebra mussels, like bounce water, like through human... I think it mostly, most likely human transport. Yeah. So like these large shipping freights. Um, I don't know if it can survive very well in ballast water because it's kind of like a low light environment, yeah. but maybe like attaching to like boat hulls and coming over. Um, there is evidence, or I guess like um, how it spread throughout the Channel Islands and um, Baja 
could be either like recreational vessels or um, because it's able to float long distances and kind of um, disperse its um, its journalings, it's, it could just be like it's becoming detached and floating with the currents and spreading that way too. So. Yeah. Is this similar to Calerpa? So it kind of is. Calerpa, um, at least on Cal in California, I think are, um, started to invade the San Francisco Bay, but they really recognized its um, its potency from how it invaded the Mediterranean. And so they really like rapidly controlled it there. I think because Sargassum Horneri wasn't really um, it wasn't really recognized as an invasive like right off the bat. Um, it was it kind of like spread. Um, unknowingly until it kind of became too much of a problem that for us to really control. But um, yeah, so chlorp is like also another invasive algae. Yeah. Is the algae actually going to create a large problem if they continue growing? So um, even though, yeah, even though it invaded in 2003, um, it really only started to proliferate um, like pretty relatively recently. So um, unfortunately, there are still a lot of unknowns about how it's impacting the environment. But there was a study that just, I think, was published this month or last month um, that found that um, the uh, kelp bass recruitment was actually significantly inhibited by the presence of this algae, or this algae as opposed to um, the native um, giant kelp. So um, that's one of the impacts of sargassum. Um, it's also hypothesized, um, which is another aspect of my research that I haven't gotten to yet, but um, basically looking at how sargassum horneri may be inhibiting giant kelp recruitment um, by taking over the space um, and holding that space. So um, that's another potential impact, but unfortunately, there's not a lot of like published data or literature um, as far as like how it's impacting. But a lot of hypotheses. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you.